Good evening, everybody. I am Carter C. Hudgens, the President and CEO of the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust. And on behalf of our staff and Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome everyone to this, the final presentation of the spring program of the Drayton Hall Distinguished Lecture Series. I'd also like to thank all of our friends that are in attendance tonight. Your support of Drayton Hall makes this type of program possible. And for those of you that are new to Drayton Hall tonight, considering a visit or considering joining the Friends program, I highly encourage it. And I and any of the staff present tonight would be more than happy to have a conversation about that program. Also like to welcome you back to the Charleston Museum in the fall as we will have two additional programs rounding out the 2017 series. Christopher Swan of Colonial Williamsburg will be talking about the conservation of Drayton Hall's furniture ahead of exhibition. And in November, Robert Hunter, ceramics expert, will be talking about the very diverse ceramics in Drayton Hall's collection, which brings up a very significant point. Many of you know that Drayton Hall is in the middle of a capital campaign aimed to transform the Drayton Hall experience. And if anybody is interested in talking further to me about the campaign to transform Drayton Hall through the construction of new facilities, which we began month before last, please see me or follow us online at www.draytonhallreimagined.org, where you'll find more information about the campaign and updates on our progress. Now, it's time for me to introduce tonight's speaker which I know you will find incredibly engaging. Taya Miles is the Mary Henrietta Graham Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan, where she teaches in the departments of Afro-American and African Studies, American Culture, History, Native American Studies, and Women's Studies. She is the author of two prize-winning works of history, Ties That Bind, the Story of an Afro-Cherokee Family in Slavery and Freedom, published in 2005, in The House on Diamond Hill, a Cherokee Plantation Story, published in 2010. She's published historical fiction, The Cherokee Rose is an example, published in 2015, a travel narrative about historic sites of slavery, as well as Tales from the Haunted South, published in 2015. And if you're interested in taking this home, they're available for sale in the foyer. She's also published various articles on women's history and black and indigenous interrelated experience. She's the co-editor with Sharon P. Holland of Crossing Waters, Crossing Worlds, The African Diaspora in Indian Country, published in 2006. Her work has been supported in recent years by the Mellon Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. Currently, Miles is writing a history of slavery in Detroit. Please join me in welcoming Taya Miles. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for coming out. I know that the weather was threatening rain and we all braved a potential storm to get here. I am very happy to be back in Charleston under the auspices of the Drayton Historic Preservation Trust. Do I have that right, Carter? Preservation. Preservation Trust's invitation. I have been here a couple of times previously, once doing research and once for an academic conference, but I have seen more and been welcomed in a way this time that I hadn't experienced in the past. I want to thank the staff and the administrators of Drayton Hall, and I especially want to thank Tara Odom, who is full of energy, full of positivity, and knows where all the great cookies and biscuits are in this city. <laughs> the title of my presentation for this evening is Phantoms of the Plantation South, an exploration of ghost tourism at sites of slavery. And I have to tell you that if we were able to time travel back five years ago, I would be asking you, what is ghost tourism? Because I had no knowledge of this huge phenomenon that's been developing over the last 10, nearly 20 years. And frankly, I didn't really have an interest in ghosts and in um, specters and in hauntings. 
I was actually raised with the notion that you don't mess with that stuff, that stuff doesn't mess with you, and I have observed that for most of my life. So what brings me here tonight to talk with you about ghost tourism? Well, actually, it was a love of historic houses and the complex stories that they can tell about various populations and various individuals that led me down a path that brought me here. I had traveled to Savannah back in 2012. I'd never been to the city before, and I had done previous research on Georgia, focusing on slavery in the Cherokee Nation of uh, the northwest part of Georgia. And I thought, I really should get down to Savannah. I went there. I wanted to visit historic sites. I wanted to learn about the history of the city. And after visiting some uh, better known sites, I was walking down a street in Madison Square, and I saw a woman standing in front of a house just kind of calling people. She was beckoning like this to people who were just walking by. And I noticed then that she was standing in front of a home that was offering tours. Now this was an unusual way to be brought into a tour. I had never experienced this um, before in Savannah or elsewhere. Um, the invitation to take this tour had um, almost a celebratory kind of feel, and I was very curious about what it was she was beckoning me toward. So I walked up to the Sorrel Weed House, I bought a ticket, and I took the tour not knowing what to expect. I didn't know at the time that the Sorrel Weed House is known as the most haunted house in Savannah, or that Savannah has been deemed the most haunted city in America. So I was walking into kind of a double whammy. While taking the tour, what I heard really surprised me, and that's what led me down this road. The tour narrative at the Sorrel Weed focuses on an enslaved young woman or adolescent girl, someone on uh, the cusp of those two age ranges, named Molly. And the story that is told on that tour is that Molly was involved in an affair with her master, Francis Sorrell. That her owner, the mistress of the home, discovered the two of them in a bed together in the slave quarters, and then committed suicide by jumping to her death from the balcony to the courtyard of the home. And that after the suicide of the mistress, Molly was found swinging from a rope in the slave quarters where she had been killed. So I want you to keep in mind that I was a person just wanting to explore historic homes um, in Savannah. <laughs> I did not know that I was walking into the most haunted house in the most haunted city, and I was completely taken aback by this narrative and very disturbed by this narrative um, for a number of reasons that I'm sure you are already intuiting. But I will just say that what stuck out to me the most during that tour and afterward was the way in which the relationship between Molly and Francis was described as an affair, which connotes consent. How can a middle-aged man who owns a teenage girl gain her consent to be involved in a sexual relationship? It's impossible, in my view. So I decided then that I wanted to research the history of Molly, the young woman, the adolescent girl, I wanted to tell her story. I left there thinking, I'm going to find Molly. And that set me on um, a research quest, which brings me here tonight. That was probably um, <laughs> a bit of a sidetrack and a teaser, because I'm not going to talk much about the Sorrel Weed House this evening. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you that I did research Molly. I looked for all the records that I could find about the Sorrel family. Um, I looked at church records, I looked at letters, I looked at census records, I looked at um, local documents that were right there in the Georgia Historical Society. I contacted the librarian and the archivist in that area, asking if they had any information about this um, relationship and about uh, these two deaths, and was told that there was nothing 
uh, in the record about this. So what I found in my quest to find and tell the story of Molly was that there was no Molly who was recorded in the historical record. There was instead a strong indication that the story about her, about her suffering, about her murder, was actually imagined by the people who own that site and who sell tickets to tourists to come in and listen to that story. So there was no Molly, but I was even more disturbed then, realizing that someone had had the gruesome imagination to make this up and to package it and to sell it in our time, recently. So that set me down the road of trying to think about the question of why? Why would anyone do this? So now we come back to the title of my lecture, Dark Tourism. What is dark tourism? A basic definition is that dark tourism is a form of entertainment that highlights violent, sinister, and macabre subject matter, such as torture, murder, death, and the return of the dead in the form of hauntings. There's a geographer named Glenn Gentry who has, I think, a very clear definition of dark tourism, and he calls it, quote, the transformation of death and disaster into saleable tourism-based commodities. Now, most of the scholarship on dark tourism is actually coming out of um, the UK. A lot of it's coming out of England. The two scholars who coined the term are named John Lennon and Malcolm Foley, and they co-authored a book titled Dark Tourism, The Attraction of Death and Disaster. They arrived at this term after doing research around the world in the decade of the 1990s and realizing they were seeing something different popping up in the places they visited. What they said in their book about this something different, which they named dark tourism, is that, quote, it is clear from a number of sources that tourists' interest in recent death, disaster, and atrocity is a growing phenomenon in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Dark tourism, as they define it, includes a range of activities, all the way from the ghost tour that I just described to uh, people visiting battlefields, cemeteries, museums that commemorate atrocities, such as the Jewish Holocaust, and so on. And what these two scholars argued was that people are interested in dark tourism and these experiences in large part because we are facing an anxiety that they describe as being attached to life in our times or to postmodern life. And so they write about these different uh, trends in our current lifestyles that they feel are producing this anxiety, <laughs> including cultural decentralization, so people not having intact cultural communities. That's that bowling, bowling alone kind of phenomenon that we've heard about in the press. Spatial disorientation, so there's people moving away from home, leaving the places they know. And disassociation from traditional institutions. They argue that there's a good deal of public doubt, you know, worry, anxiety, concern that stems from these aspects of our modern day culture, and that people try to address this doubt by indirectly kind of toying with death or, or confronting death, thinking about decline, but in a way that is not um, as frightening as it would be if they just sat down and thought, what's happening to our culture? What's happening to our country? Instead, it goes tourism. Dark tourism, they argue, is a way for people to address those worries. Now, this is an idea that other scholars share, and a term has developed in American Studies scholarship 
to try to define this experience, which is millennial anxiety. Millennial anxiety is a term that uh, is being used to think about what's happening for us in our present moment, um, the worries and the fears that we carry with us. There are a number of other um, single causes that scholars talk about for the rise of dark tourism, and I'm going to list off a few of them. Um, one is uh, morbid curiosity, one is uh, restorative nostalgia, the idea that these sites often connect to the past and people are seeking a way to connect back to that past. Another is um, a search for novelty. Another is the way in which our society has now really normalized crime and deviance and people seek that out. Another idea is that people are, quote, dicing with death. That is, they want to kind of look into the abyss, but not exactly jump into it. As I thought about these different potential causes, I've added my own list. And um, they are climate change, but I was just speaking about uh, earlier um, uh, with someone in this room. So fears about climate change, uh, fears about a financial collapse, and fears about uh, America's decline as a global superpower, and then also possibly the decrease in traditional religious observance. You've probably heard uh, in the news the various Pew studies that show that many more people identify as being a part of this category called the nuns. They don't have a religious affiliation. With less religious affiliation, but a desire for spirituality, I think it makes sense that people would try to gravitate toward opportunities to explore what happens after death outside of that religious context. So a lot of this interest in dark tourism probably stems from our moment in time, the fear and anxiety that comes from the turning of a century, all the different um, changes that are happening in this country and around the world, but also there is an abiding human um, preoccupation with death, with the possibilities, the questions about an afterlife, and with what happens on the other side of that mysterious divide. So public interest has contributed to this surge in dark tourism. But there's another uh, factor here that's led to the growth, and that is that tourism as an industry overall has been taking off within basically the same time frame so we have the, the coming of the turn of the century. We've just passed it. So in the 90s, it was coming. Now we've just barely passed it, which was feeding this millennial anxiety. And at the same time, global tourism was really taking off. There's a journalist named Elizabeth Becker who has written a really great book called Overbooked, and it's about the global tourism industry. And she makes some points that I think are really important. She says that one out of every 10 people on the globe is involved in the tourism industry. She says that this is um, a massive sector of the world economy that we just don't see and we don't notice. And she points out that we have language for things like you know, big oil, we, don't, we all know what big oil refers to, or um, big agriculture, big pharma, you know, pharmaceuticals, but we don't have a big tourism kind of idea. We haven't noticed the growth of this industry. Well, she says that it has skyrocketed. And as it has grown, tourism has, like any other industry, needed to diversify, needed to uh, grow its markets, and to find larger customer bases. What Becker says about dark tourism is that it has grown right alongside of global tourism, and that it is what she describes as a lucrative niche market within the broader growth of tourism. So part of this might be our psychology, why people are drawn to this, and part of it's just that, it's just that we have more tourism offerings, there's more competition in the industry, and companies and individuals are needing to branch out to find those audiences. So now we have 
a lucrative segment of the tourism industry that specializes in what we might call the commodification of death. Now within that specialized market, within dark tourism, there are all kinds of subsets of experiences. Ghost tourism is defined as a kind, a type of dark tourism. And it's one that tourism and travel studies scholars describe as being um, on the lighter side of dark tourism. Richard Sharpley, who's one of those British scholars who developed this idea, has described ghost tourism as existing on, quote, a playful, frivolous end of the dark tourism spectrum. A performance artist named Robert Thompson, who spoke on a panel with Sharpley and who has given ghost tours, agreed with that idea, with that argument, and Thompson described ghost tourism as being all about fun and frivolity and people wanting to be silly. Thompson added that, quote, the meta-narrative that informs the whole ghost tour experience is that it's a game, fun, playing with the idea of truth. But Thompson also said, and again, he's an artist and uh, a tour guide. Thompson also said that ghost tours are money-making ventures. He said ghost tourism is, quote, a purely capitalistic enterprise that, quote, brings more business in. And I think it's helpful, I hope it's helpful, I think it's important to have the voice of a tour guide in the mix, because on the one hand, Thompson was recognizing there is a profit motive involved in the growth of ghost tourism as a part of dark tourism. But he also pointed out that people don't go into this with ill intentions. They go into it thinking that they're going to have fun. They're seeking entertainment. Some of them are seeking to learn and hoping they can combine having fun with a little bit of learning. But ghost tourism, in my view, is um, seductive and dangerously so because it takes these desires for fun and frivolity and these desires to learn about history and connects them to histories of trauma without fully respecting or explaining those histories of trauma and the power relations therein. So you have people who are interested, who are eager, who are there, and you have their emotions in your hands. And what ghost tourism does, in my view, is it mixes these elements up in a way that can become dangerous, such that people can leave a tour that has featured a ghost like Molly, who was sexually abused by her master, who was murdered, and think that was a fun time. Now my interest as a slavery studies and American studies scholar is in the way that sites of slavery have been folded into ghost tourism. So historic sites where slavery was practiced have been folded into ghost tourism. And also in how southern ghost tourism may be reflective of racial and gender dynamics in American culture today. Now with that point, what I'm trying to get at is the question that I was asking myself about the Sorrel Weed House once I knew that Molly's story was a fabrication. It's the question of why. I think that question, why, why create a story like that now? Why tell it? Why are the tickets selling so well? Why is it profitable? I think that why question really circles back to the issue of racial and gender dynamics today. It is problematic that people want to indulge in those kinds of stories in which not just a black woman, but I will add, and I think this is important, also a white woman, they're killed. And um, they're shown in their suffering. And people are invited to come and stand in the very places uh, where they lost their lives. 
So my argument coming out of this research is that these ghosts who appear in stories at sites where slavery was practiced in the South represent the continuation of a troubled past in the present and hint at the stubborn notion that the spirit of the racially conservative Old South, just like a ghostly entity, will never die. That's the idea that I've been working with in this research, that these ghosts are coming back and they are really reinforcing old narratives about power. So I'm going to shift now after that um, framing to some experiences that I've had on the road with dark tourism and with ghost tourism. I took a trip to the Mississippi River Road Trail, which goes through Louisiana and Mississippi. By the time I did this trip in 2014, I now knew about ghost tourism and dark tourism, and I was actually trying to see if I could identify sites where enslaved people were, uh, were excuse me, an important part of those tour narratives. So I did a portion of the Mississippi River Road Trail, and what I found for the most part was that many of these plantation homes were actually still telling a fairly traditional narrative that focused on the white families in the home, the important moments in their lives, their wealth and their luxury, all the beautiful things they had, the lovely architecture of their homes, and sometimes included um, brief mentions of uh, black people in servile positions. While on this trail, I came across this, this building, which I had read about uh, previously. This is uh, Mammy's Cupboard. And it's um, on the highway to Natchez on this river road. You can see that um, this is a restaurant where people can go into um, Mammy, so-called Mammy's skirts and have a meal. The structure dates back to the 1940s, but um, I took this photo that was saying that it's open Tuesday through Saturday in 2014. Also, while taking this trail, I saw in a number of um, the homes that I visited um, mammy dolls for sale that looked quite a lot like um, this image to the left. I saw uh, mammy figurines for sale. I saw copies of the children's book Little Black Sambo. And every once in a while, I would see an African-American history book or uh, a work of literature by a black author. But for the most part, these places were telling traditional narratives. And uh, they were selling what I've come to think of as plantation kitsch. <coughs> so I think that uh, what I'm describing as far as dark tourism is still um, just a facet of plantation tourism. But it is a facet that seems to be growing because, again, there is um, profit to be had there. While taking this trail, I tried to identify which of the homes I should spend the most time at. And um, I came up with four places based on reading about them in um, books about the hauntings, in travel guides about the South, um, and so on. And uh, in one of these books, this was a, a major book that I used called Louisiana's Haunted Plantations. The author Jill Pascoe had written that, quote, every respectable plantation has at least one ghost. So I thought there would be a lot to work with, and, and um, there was. I identified four that had stories about enslaved people that were um, a major part of what they were doing. One of those was the Myrtles Plantation, which had several enslaved specters and also a spiritual portal, which I will describe in a little bit. The Frogmore Plantation, which had um, a house slave who was a ghost. The Ormond Plantation, which had been cursed by an angry slave. And Lloyd Hall, where a slave nanny was supposed to have been poisoned to death. Now, I had a lot of choices and only about three days on this particular visit. So um, I visited Frogmore and took a tour there. I spent the night at the Ormond Plantation. And that was very interesting because um, the plantation 
owners had been interviewed for these guidebooks and they had said that this place um, was cursed by an angry slave. But while there, and getting my, my key for the room to spend the night, I was assured, oh, no, no, no. There's no dangerous curse, don't worry. So uh, sort of two stories going on there. The curse to draw you in, but no curse when it's time to uh, have you taken to your room. But I devoted most of my time to the Myrtles, um, really because it's the most famous of all of these um, plantations. It flaunts its ghosts, and it had um, various, various, excuse me, prominent stories about enslaved people. Now, the Myrtles Plantation seemed to be overwhelmed by hauntings once I started to take a look at it a little bit more closely. The sensational National Enquirer magazine, I don't mean sensational as in great, <laughs> okay, uh, had dubbed this site, the Myrtles Plantation, America's most haunted house in the 1980s and that appellation stuck. So visitors from around uh, the US and the world come to the Myrtles, um, totaling a number of, round, of around 40,000 per year, in part to experience the hauntings there. Now a bit of history about the Myrtles. I don't wanna go into too much detail, I want you to kind of stick with me, but, but some, of these, some of these facts will um, come into play later because you'll be able to compare the history with the ghost tour narrative at the Myrtles. The Myrtles Plantation was established in the 1700s by David Bradford, who came south after participating in the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, which was a rebellion against paying taxes. He fled with uh, many others from um, George Washington's crackdown on these rebels and he bought land in Louisiana, which had previously been part of a Spanish land grant. So Bradford moved in. He brought his wife, Elizabeth, and um, they had some children already and then had more children for a total of five. And the first building on the plantation was a little white house that you don't see here, but you'll see later in the photos. That house now serves as um, what's called the general's store at the Myrtles. So Bradford died, but his daughter, Sarah Matilda Bradford, married a man named Clark Woodruff, who was a lawyer in the area, and Woodruff would become a judge. Uh, both Bradford and Woodruff owned enslaved people, and the number of people they have shifts over time. It seems to me that um, there are new purchases being had, and there are trades being made with um, Sarah's mother. The best number that I have for how many enslaved people were living there in this period, the Bradford spanning into the Woodward, the Woodruff, excuse me, period, is um, 480 enslaved people. Um, and the Woodruffs, at, at the time that they had this many enslaved people, uh, were also um, in possession of approximately 4,000 acres. Now, in 1834, Woodruff, who again had married into the Bradford family, sold the plantation to a man named Ruffin Gray Sterling and his wife, Mary Cobb. So a new family comes in. The Sterlings owned 173 black men, women, and children who, according to census records, Arranged, arranged in age from infancy, so babies just born, to 70 years old. And this family, the Sterlings, determined that they wanted to turn the Myrtles into their personal show place. So they enlarged the plantation home, they added all kinds of embellishments, um, and they had a number of crepe Myrtles planted on the property and then changed the name, gave it the name, the Myrtles. So now we're in the era of the Sterling family. Sarah Sterling, a daughter of the Sterlings who bought the plantation, married an attorney named William Winter in 1852. Sarah's mother requested the help of William Winter in operating the property, 
but the family lost the plantation um, to debt soon after the Civil War. In the 1870s, the family regained the property, and soon thereafter, William Winter um, was murdered by an unknown assailant. You know, he, was, um, he was shot right there on the plantation. There are a, a number of theories about why he was shot, but no one actually knows what happened. After William Winter died, Sarah and her mother remained at the Myrtles until their deaths, and then the plantation uh, changed hands many times. So that's the basic history of who owned the plantation, how many enslaved people um, were held there under duress and against their will, and um, the different families who lived there. There have been three books that I know of that have been written about the Myrtles. One is a memoir by a former owner of the plantation whose name is Francis Hermine. Another is a history by a, an author named Rebecca Pittman. And another is a mystery novel with a voodoo theme that was written by a former um, head docent at the Myrtles. Now, um, the literature and lore on the Myrtles is very rich because uh, there are these books and there are also, of course, um, brochures and there are um, the blogs and the narratives that people who visit the plantation put online. It's all very rich. But trying to find information about African Americans at the Myrtles is incredibly difficult. In fact, I went to the Historical Society and asked where I might find this information. Um, this was um, a well-stocked historical society with you know, all kinds of books on the walls. And uh, the person directed me to the Louisiana haunting book that I quoted to you from a moment ago. So she sent me to um, a book about haunted places and ghosts to learn about African American history. So for the stories of black people who lived at the Myrtles, clearly the overwhelming majority of people who were ever at the Myrtles, um, we only have the trail of ghosts. Now, I met these ghosts at the Myrtles during a visit. And I actually visited um, three times while doing this research. At this particular visit, I was going to stay overnight, and I had dinner in the Carriage House restaurant. And I hope I remember to come back to you and tell you about a drink they served there. <laughs> but I had dinner at the Carriage House restaurant, and then I joined a, a fellow guest to wait on the back porch for the evening mystery tour to begin. Our tour was being led by um, the head docent that evening, a very knowledgeable person who had done a lot of research on the house and who was an incredible storyteller, just a riveting storyteller. We started on the first floor of the home and um, he began by pointing out some architectural features and uh, then he moved into uh, the fact that the Myrtles was haunted. Now he said that even though he had never seen a ghost there himself, he was sure that the hauntings were true because he has felt things and he has been told a number of stories um, by people who have stayed there. So then our guide um, related some of these stories that he had heard. Uh, there had been a couple who was staying in the Myrtles uh, overnight. <laughs> And um, a ghost got a hold of the husband's loose change and started pelting it at the couple. In another story that he told us, um, a different couple was visiting from New Orleans and they were uh, in bed that night and all of a sudden um, the husband was knocked off the bed by someone who was not there. It turned out that there was a figure, a shape, um, that was appearing underneath the sheets right before their eyes. And so the couple jumped out of bed, got their clothes, and left the home. So our tour guide told us that um, not everyone makes it through the night at the Myrtles Plantation. <laughs> now, keep in mind, keep in mind that we were staying overnight. <laughs> so he was kind of upping the sense of, um, I guess, excitement and fear, that combination that, that we might feel by telling us this at the start of our tour. 
after telling us that um, a lot of people don't make it through the night, he uh, reassured us that no one had been seriously hurt <laughs> and that he was sure that the ghost really meant no harm. At this point, our guide went into the signature tale, the signature story of the Myrtles plantation. He described this as the legend of Chloe, and he said that he believes this is the story of one of our ghosts. So I'm going to tell you the story as he related it and as I've heard it um, told at other times at the Myrtles plantation. Now you remember Clark Woodruff, who had married into the Bradford family. The Bradfords had been the first family um, there at the Myrtles. In the tour, our guide told us that uh, Judge Woodruff was walking around his plantation one day and he noticed a slave girl on the plantation. She was the 13 or 14 year old Chloe. Taking a liking to Chloe, he brought her into the main house and took her as his concubine. But Chloe had a bad habit of eavesdropping on the judge. One day he caught her with her ear pressed to the door while he was conducting important business. As punishment, George Woodruff had one of Chloe's ears cut off, her left ear, and he banished her to the plantation kitchen behind the big house. Chloe then took to wearing a head wrap to hide her deformity and wore only one earring in her remaining ear. Now, Chloe could not stand the fact that Woodruff had exiled her from the house. She wanted to get back into the house and she wanted to get back into his good graces. So she concocted a plan. She decided to bake a birthday cake for the judge's twin daughters and to spike it with the poisonous leaves of the oleander plant. Now, the cake would sicken the girls, Chloe figured, but she would be there to nurse them back to health and the judge would forgive her for everything and take her back into the home. But Chloe's plan went awry. The judge's wife and his twin daughters both died from the toxic cake. A terrified Chloe ran to the slave quarter seeking asylum, but her fellow slaves revealed her whereabouts to the judge and made her confess. The judge then forced the other slaves to hang Chloe and afterward, they dumped her body into the Mississippi River. Due to her violent death and her improper burial, Chloe haunts the big house and the grounds of the Myrtles today. After this story, our guide led us into the French bedroom, which was an ornate room filled with gold-leafed furnishings. He told us a story about an actress who had come to the plantation to um, play Chloe in a performance. This actress, he said, saw a black woman in a green mist floating toward her. She actually was seeing the ghost of Chloe. She panicked, she ran, and she bumped her head on the locked door, bloodying herself. She was, he told us though, the only person to have really been hurt at the riddles. Now, in the same French bedroom, our guide started in on another story about a black woman named Cleo. If you could see the text in front of me, uh, you would recognize how close the spellings of these names are. They're almost exactly the same with some letters switched around, Chloe and Cleo. Um, but Cleo is a different person, and uh, the story he told us about her went as follows. Cleo was a voodoo priestess. She lived at the nearby Solitude Plantation. And in the 1840s, the Sterling family, who um, was um, in possession of the Myrtle at the time, had a child who was suffering from yellow fever. Now, Ruffin Sterling was desperate to save his child. And even though he had a strong distaste for voodoo, he requested Cleo's services. So Cleo came and she was left to work her dark ritual magic on the child in the nursery. Now, lest you forget, this is the tour narrative, this is not me talking to you. I would not be using this kind of language. So Cleo was left to work her dark ritual magic 
And uh, all through the night, people on the plantation could hear the sounds of drums and mysterious chants echoing. Now finally, Cleo emerged, and she proclaimed the girl healed. Sterling was so grateful that he allowed Cleo, a lowly slave, to sleep in his wife's beautiful French bedroom. By dawn, however, Sterling discovered that his daughter had passed away. So he shouted for the overseer, and together they dragged the sleeping Cleo from the gilded room to the front yard of the Myrtles, where they strung her up on an oak tree, killing her. <coughs> now, in recent years, a film producer has stayed in the French bedroom and saw Cleo hanging from the ceiling, quote, as vividly as a real lynching, end quote. Now, this worried uh, the Myrtles administration, so they no longer allow anyone to sleep in the French bedroom. <laughs> After this, our guide took us into um, a hallway area where he showed us the Myrtles' famous haunted mirror. Now, this is a mirror that contains dark shadows that are said to be the imprinted spirits of the dead um, wife and children who were killed by that poisonous cake, and also um, an impression somehow of Chloe's Mississippi River um, burial. No matter how often they change the glass in that uh, mirror, those impressions just keep coming back. So at this moment in the tour, um, the guests are invited to take photographs of, of the haunted mirror, and I'll show you a picture, my picture of us taking pictures in a moment. Um, guests are also encouraged to uh, capture photos outside and are told that we might just capture Chloe because uh, other guests have taken pictures of Chloe. Um, in fact, one of these pictures includes a hazy image of Chloe hanging dead from a tree. Now, you did just hear me tell a story in which it was Cleo hanging from the tree and not Chloe, but um, these women uh, get mixed up quite often in stories about the Myrtles. After the haunted mirror, um, we, were, we were taken to see a spiritual portal that is in the middle of the gentleman's parlor. This is a place where spirits can pass from one world to the next. And this portal exists because the home was built on top of um, an ancient Tunica Indian village. I'm getting it all in here. <laughs> I hope you're recognizing these themes and these tropes. So the, the, um, the presence of these Indians, their absent presence, creates a special kind of spirituality in this house. There's the portal. We were nearing the end of our tour, and our guide um, took us into the final room, and he showed us a photograph that had been taken by the owner in 1992. And this was a photograph of Chloe. In the photo, you see uh, the faint outline of a black woman um, with a head wrap and a long skirt. And you also see two shadows in the tree, and they're supposed to be the dead children that she killed with the cake. Now, there are other ghosts that haunt the Myrtles. I mean, the Myrtles is full of them. But the stories that are narrated the most vividly and in the most detail are those about Chloe and Cleo. And in fact, on one of my visits to the Myrtles, um, a different guide said, I'm going to tell you the story of our most famous Myrtle's ghost. Who am I talking about? And the group started saying, Chloe, Chloe, Chloe. So people came knowing about her, I think in part because there is um, a large ghost tourism culture. And people post their, their photos online and their thoughts and comments online, and, and people um, know what to expect before they come. So Chloe is famous. I uh, told you that I hoped I would remember to tell you about a drink in the carriage house. I didn't have one of these drinks, but they do sell Chloe's Bloody Mary. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. I felt the same way when I saw it there. So she is quite the star. But there are other ghosts. Um, there are the children who were killed by Chloe. There was a child lost to yellow fever. Um, there is William Winter. Remember, he was shot by someone, and no one knows you know, who or why. Uh, then there's Winter's wife, who, after uh, he was shot, 
uh, was mourning for him, and her, her ghost floats around. She wears a black dress. Um, there is a very polite, this is not my adjective, there is a polite Confederate soldier who um, frequents the home, and there is a caretaker from the 1920s who wanders the grounds, sometimes telling tourists that the place is closed. <laughs> I don't know what his motives are. So, I've just described to you some of the history of this plantation and of the tour that I took. And I suggested that I heard the tour a number of times and um, the tour really is pretty much the same. I mean, every guide puts her or his um, or their own spin on the tour. And so you do hear differences, but it's clear that there is um, a narrative, um, something like a script, but it's flexible but there is um, a storyline that they are all working from. So now I want to tell you some of my thoughts about this tour. And um, I've been hearing uh, and, and enjoying your interaction with me, and so this is probably not going to be a surprise to you, you know, uh, what I think about this. My view is that the stories of Chloe and Cleo that are told on the Myrtle's Mystery Tour are fundamentally stories of violence against black women, and that includes sexual violence, <gasps> physical violence, and ideological violence, the violence of ideas. So Chloe is in a position of sexual submission to a male slaveholder who is twice her age, but this situation is presented as not just being commonplace, something that we shouldn't really think much about, but also as Chloe's preferred situation. When she's sent out of the house, she resorts to schemes to try to get back into the house, and I'll return to that point later. Now, Cleo comes into the story as a voodoo priestess, which is a stereotype in and of itself, and that's a way to bring in, I think, um, kind of a local flavor and an exoticism that people expect to see on a tour like this. Um, but the practice of Cleo's faith is reduced to uh, primitive Africanness, and her spirituality is rendered as being dangerous. Now, Cleo's murder is eroticized. She is dragged out of um, the, the beautiful bedroom um, by two white men who um, then murder her in the yard. And both Chloe and Cleo are, to some extent, culpable in these stories. Because after all, they are responsible for the deaths of three white children between them. So I think that there is an implication, a suggestion, that um, they, in some way, took part in their own demise you know, through their actions or their failures, in the case of Cleo. Now, these stories of Chloe and Cleo as I mentioned earlier, have been taken up and embraced and embellished by a number of people. And I'm not sure if, if, if the folks who are writing about them recognize this, but their renditions, their representations, fall right into two major stereotypes of black women, the Jezebel and the Mammy. The Jezebel type uh, is named for a North African woman in the Bible who is said to be a sexual temptress, and um, it was a term used to describe black women going all the way back to European men's travel narratives where they encountered African women for the first time and made all kinds of ethnocentric assumptions about African women's character based on things like their dress, without any acknowledgement or recognition that we're talking about a vastly different climate than England, for instance. These travel narratives described African women as um, being animalistic, as being almost animals, um, as being lewd, walking around um, naked or nude, having no pain in childbirth, because they're basically animals, right? Um, and as having uh, so-called monstrous features. Um, they also describe them as having very loose sexual practices, including 
having sexual relations with um, orangutans. And these ideas about black women's sexual deformity and lewdness and lasciviousness carried over into practices of slavery in the United States. And um, they even worsened because while enslaved, black women had no control over their own bodies. They didn't have the right to protect their bodies. They had no um, self-defense when they were um, displayed at a slave auction and their clothes were torn off them in front of groups of people. They had no recourse for um, defending themselves when they were sexually abused. And as the historian Deborah Gray White has pointed out, um, they also, just in the everyday um, course of doing their forced work, had to do things that were viewed as being unladylike, such as a simple act of, of kind of hiking up their skirts to do field work. The conditions of their enslavement, the conditions forced upon them, were used as further evidence that they had no modesty and they had no chastity. The fact that they were the repeated victims of sexual assault just added to the idea that they were tempting white men and that they wanted these relationships. So Chloe, a young girl on the Myrtles Plantation who is described by various tour guides of being from age 12 to 14, so we're talking about a child to a young teen, is rendered as uh, a classic Jezebel type. She catches the judge's eye with the way the story is told. She wins a place in his household. She wants to stay in his home. She schemes to keep him. And stories told by others just add to that layer of uh, the Jezebel type for Chloe. Francis Kermine, who is the author of uh, this book, The Myrtle's Plantation, uh, was a former owner of the home. And in this book, she talks about a slave ghost who was um, a beautiful, quote, mulatto slave um, who was the daughter of a slave woman and a white man. And Kermine also talks in this book about her own psychological connection with Sarah Woodruff. I remember Judge Woodruff is the one who goes out and supposedly picks, ooh, excuse me, um, supposedly picks Chloe out from uh, the, the young women working on the plantation. So Kermine, in this book, describes her psychological connection with Sarah Woodruff, the mistress. Kermine starts to feel like she is the mistress um, in this book. And she talks about um, hearing voodoo drums, going to the distance, and uh, the house servants humming as they went about their tasks. And um, she also talks about her husband, quote, carrying on with one of the slaves behind her back. I bet this is really confusing, so let me just try to back up and say, Frances Kermine owned the Myrtles. She published this book in 2005. And in this book, she imagines herself as, as kind of mind melding with Sarah Woodruff. She feels what Sarah Woodruff feels and, and those kinds of things. So um, she puts herself in the place of the mistress. She knows that her husband is, is with uh, one of the slaves behind her back. And um, on the last page of the book, she realizes um, that the slave woman has poisoned her cup of tea in order to try to steal her husband. So Chloe, as a Jezebel, is being redescribed in this book um, written by an owner of the Myrtles. There are other examples, too, in um, tour books about haunted Louisiana. Um, one example includes uh, a couple who noticed that Chloe was coming in, and, and uh, the ghost, the spirit of Chloe, was coming in and um, messing with their sheets, disturbing their sheets, and, and um, causing disorder. And the author of this book says that uh, this was really a battle that Chloe was having with her mistress. 
Now, the author doesn't say this, but I think it's kind of obvious that um, this is a, a, a battle over um, the master bedroom and uh, over which woman should have the place in that bed. And in this, in this story, uh, Chloe is competing with her mistress for the space in that bed. Chloe, the 12 to 14 year old girl who was selected by the judge to come in and be his quote concubine. Chloe also, um, as a part of her conniving ways, that's not my language, that's the language of Barbara Sillery, the author of this book, Louisiana Hauntings. Um, in her conniving ways, she steals earrings from present day visitors to the site so that she can adorn herself, um, her one ear, um, with these things. So this is an ugly side of Chloe's representation, I think, this Jezebel, that she is a sexual temptress who wants something that, that she should not have, who wants to destroy the white family, and so on. But some people um, see her story as romantic, and this, I think, is probably the most disturbing thing that I um, heard at the tour. Um, I heard this from one of the guides who, who um, wanted um, their identity to be um, kind of protected. And this guide said that Chloe has a number of, quote, fans, that many of these fans are young girls who see Chloe as a sort of, quote, Disney princess figure. Yes. And this guide told me that these young girls come to the tour and they listen to the story about Chloe with, quote, starry eyes, because they see her as this lowly person out in the field. I mean, think about, um, I'm not bringing a Disney to mind, but I mean, think about pretty woman, right? They see her as a lowly person in the fields who is brought into the big house and who um, is made into the mistress, so nearly the wife of the owner, and they are devastated when she's kicked out. Um, a romantic view of her situation being expressed by young girls. Now the figure of Chloe is plastic. It's flexible. It can change, and it does change and shift in all of these different renditions of um, Chloe and her ghostly activities. So on the one hand, people see her as being beautiful and uh, light-skinned and you know, wearing flowing gowns. On the other hand, people also see her as being um, large in size, as being dark-skinned, as wearing a headscarf. So they see her as a mammy. And Kermin, the author of, of the book, um, sees slave ghosts in both these guises. I think a lot of the story actually um, kind of goes back to this book. Now, the mammy is a myth that was really created by Southern apologists for slavery in the 1830s period when abolitionism was really taking off and gaining strength. And this myth represented uh, a black woman who was incredibly loyal to the white family. She wanted nothing more than um, to raise white children, to care for them. And she didn't have concern for her own children. She loved the white children at the expense of her own children. The manly figure, as you all know, you've seen this imagery, was often rendered as being heavy set, as being darker skinned, as being older, as wearing a headscarf, sort of the polar opposite from the Jezebel figure, who was often rendered as being younger, as being light skinned, um, as being thin, and so on. Now, Chloe, as um, a mammy, kind of in her mammy guise, is described as moving through the Myrtle's plantation house, holding a candle, and um, turning down the beds for people, turning down the beds for guests. Visitors to the Myrtle's plantation describe seeing Chloe the ghost who is basically working as um, an unpaid staff person still to make them comfortable in that house. And this image of Chloe with the candle floating through, taking care of people, again, dates back to um, this, this Myrtle's Plantation memoir. So we have Chloe and her flexibility between the Jezebel and the Mammy. We have Cleo, who is the stereotypical voodoo priestess. All in many ways, creating a sense of familiarity and comfort for visitors to the Myrtle's plantation. 
And what I concluded is that um, safety and comfort seem to really be what the Myrtles tours were about in the end. I talked about how violent these stories were, but the violence was rendered with laughter. The violence was undercut um, in these stories. And what people were left with was um, the image of these ghosts who are kind of harmless. I mean, so Chloe's there, she'll take your earring. Or she'll turn down your bed sheets. And there were no sightings of Cleo right by the house, perhaps because a Cleo figure might actually feel a little more dangerous. So this tour, in my view, really was reproducing the scene of the rural plantation um, that was supposedly idyllic and where there were um, happy enslaved people, especially women, there who only wanted to tend to people's needs, to care for them. Any kind of racial threat that might be possible was contained and submerged in these stories. I mean, think about it. If we were going to write a ghost story about a plantation, would we create a ghost who came back and turned down sheets? <laughs> I mean, I know I, that's not where I would go um, with that story. So I concluded that containment is really um, the key to Chloe, Chloe's story. And again, Chloe is the, the big star ghost at the Myrtles. Um, the story blunts any kind of threat that might be called up by her attempted poisoning of um, the children. And I think this is really important because what I think is happening here, um, I'm not a psychologist, but I think this is happening at sort of a subconscious level, is that right now, today, we all realize that we have racial problems and challenges in our country. They have not gone away. And so in some ways, we know that we have to take stock of that. But we're afraid of what it really means and what it could really lead to, and so we just kind of take a stick and poke at it. And I think that's partly what Chloe's story does. It raises the specter of a whole host of terrible things, but in the end, contains those things for us so we can leave the tour and go across the way and have a drink. Now, I'm going to show you um, a few more images that I took at the Myrtles and then conclude with some final thoughts. This is Halloween. You can probably guess a big holiday at the Myrtles. Um, it was really interesting to be there um, at Halloween. It was packed. I'd been there other times too. This, is, this was um, a really packed occasion. And so I was describing, I think maybe yesterday when I had a chance to talk with uh, some of the interpreters at Drayton Hall, a wonderful conversation. I was describing how um, while I was here on Halloween, there were people who um, put on their white terry cloth bathrobes provided by the Myrtles Inn and were going around, running around saying, ooh. So people were having a lot of fun. Um, now, these were folks who had just heard the tour I described to you. Okay. A look into the gift shop. This gift shop is inside the general store, which was uh, the first building <laughs> built on the plantation in the 1790s. There's the general over there. Um, you can buy your voodoo dolls there. You can buy your mammy dolls there. And this doll, I purchased her. Um, she is representative of Chloe. She was made by uh, a local craftsperson who has actually seen Chloe and used that um, interaction as inspiration for creating this doll, which is a mammy doll. Some more images. Um, this is the courtyard, the porch where we waited for the tour, and most disturbingly to me, these are members of a Girl Scout troop. Look at the age of these kids. Think about these little girls, these little girls, hearing what I just described to you, the narrative of that tour, and whether or not they know it now, how that would sink into their consciousness and their sense of self. Up here to the left is uh, the image of Chloe that was taken by the owner of the Myrtles. Soon after she acquired the property, she saw Chloe. I mean, that's 
handy, that's convenient, but, um, and snap the photograph. You can buy this photograph as a postcard. Um, this picture to the, uh, to the upper, I guess you're right, is a photo online. So these images are also online. And the one in the center is one that I took of all of us raising our cameras, including me, it's how I got the picture, uh, to take a shot of the famous haunted mirror. And cameras are not allowed throughout most of the tour. This is the, really the one moment. And I think this is partly because the operators of the site, they want these pictures to circulate. This is advertising for them if people are gonna be posting the famous haunted mirror. And at this moment, the other electronics that people took out were their ghost hunting um, gadgets. Because this is the time when you are allowed to have electronics out. So they, um, there were three people on the tour that I took who, who brought out, um, there are apps that can help you to identify if there's a ghost there. Um, there are machines um, that can help you to determine if the temperature has changed in the room. And so th they did that at that time. So um, I'm gonna conclude. I'll try to speed up my conclusion a little bit. By telling you that what was more alarming than any of this that I've already shared with you um, was the fact that when I started doing research on Chloe, this is gonna sound familiar, I couldn't find one shred of evidence that Chloe had ever existed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No Chloe in uh, the records of the families that live there. And in fact, I mean, I, people can be really wonderful. And I think that a number of um, the folks who give these tours, I mean, I think sometimes they want to be telling a different story. So some of the tour guides actually told me some behind the scenes things about, about Chloe, such as, nope, we don't have any evidence that she exists either. Um, and she just started popping up, um, I won't go into specifics, but at a certain time, um, when there needed to be a commercial change um, at the home. So that was, again, the most alarming part to me. I mean, the tour in and of itself is bad enough, but the fact that somebody made this up recently um, is even more worrisome. So I just want to say that uh, there's an idea that I've been using to think about this. It comes from a man named Daniel Borstein. He's an academic um, who, who is a cultural critic. And he talks about uh, what he calls pseudo-events. And he says that pseudo-events are um, manufactured happenings for which the relation to the underlying reality of the situation is ambiguous. So events that are created, but the connection is not exactly really clear. Uh, that is the case here. I would not be surprised if there were young black women or adolescent girls who were sex sexually abused on this plantation because it was a common occurrence. So um, an ambiguous underlying reality, but the event itself, the pseudo event is manufactured. Uh, and why? Well, Borstein argues that the pseudo-events are particular, particularly attractive to tourists who want to experience reproductions that meet familiar expectations that are at the same time exciting and strange. So he's saying tourists are exactly the market for these kinds of events because they want to be familiar I'll go back to my language of they want to be comfortable, and yet they want excitement. So there, there have to be events that can uh, feed both those desires at once. Chloe's story satisfies expectations about the shadow side of the plantation setting, while at the same time undercutting any serious analysis of the power dynamics there. So tourists at the Myrtles and at similar sites can flirt with the danger of racial and sexual taboos while never having to really think about human subjection, the corruption of power, and their own complicity in the reproduction of plantation culture scripts. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
component of tourism, particularly in the American South. So thank you. We've got time for one or two questions. All right, up at the back. Um, I have an observation and a question. First, even the names Chloe and Cleo have been sort of whitened and uh, exoticized. And I was wondering if you had thought about that. And I was also wondering um, if you come across any similar type narratives in the Charleston plantation area. I have not thought about the names being exoticized. But um, I do agree with you that I think they are. Um, and in Charleston, I must say that I have not taken any of the ghost tours. I showed you lots of ghost tour pamphlets. I haven't taken those tours. Um, I took one tour that was kind of a, a hybrid tour. But I haven't done the deep dive here. The plantation tours that I have taken have not included this. I mean, it is actually, I've been getting every minute that I can um, here to spend at these various plantations to, to kind of get a taste of what they're doing. And I haven't seen this. And um, I'm relieved and um, I'm heartened by what I've seen here. It's not to say that it's all perfect. We all have a long way to go. But I think that the sites here that I have seen are, are really making an effort to interpret and to narrate the lives of enslaved people and to varying degrees to recognize those power dynamics. So um, I got a chance to go to Middleton and um, Drayton Hall and also the McLeod Plantation. And at every one of those sites, I saw this effort underway. Um, I really can't speak to why that's the case, except to, to maybe raise the question of whether it might have to do with the fact that Savannah kind of, it kind of came to life um, as a tourist attraction um, after Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil came out, and that, and that film came out. Um, it is now supposedly the most haunted city in America. It, it's uh, got that title. So I think, a, a, and again, I'm speculating here, but I think a lot more of their industry depends on that because that's how they, they came into the public eye. Um, I don't know Charleston, Charleston well, you know it better than I do, but I have the sense that Charleston has more of a sense of pride in um, historical research that um, backs up some of these sites. I think that, that may be why there's that difference. But if anyone knows of, of sites here that are doing this, I would like to hear about them. Well, um, I wasn't planning on continuing this. Right now I'm working on a book on slavery in Detroit, uh, because slavery did exist in Detroit. And, and the more that scholars kind of peel back these layers, the more we see that slavery seems to have been practiced just about everywhere in this country. Um, so it was practiced in Detroit for quite a long time, and I've been trying to piece that, that narrative together. But I have to tell you that I have become really fascinated by um, an object, uh, an, um, a material artifact that's called Ashley's Sack. Have any of you all seen that, Ashley's Sack? Some of you are shaking your heads. It used to be at Middleton Place. And currently, it's in the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. And um, the story about Ashley's Sack is that um, an enslaved girl named Ashley was given, it's a bag, it's a cotton bag, um, given this bag by her mother at the time of her sale. And um, the sack is embroidered with this story. And the embroidery was um, supposedly done, it's signed, um, signed through stitches by a descendant of Ashley who says what happened and who uh, describes the contents of that sack. I saw this item at the museum in DC and um, I found it to be incredibly moving. You know, I haven't started the research and um, there are others who are doing research on this too, so I think it will take some time to figure out what story I might want to, to tell about that, but um, I plan to come back. I mean, um, the Ashley River area is where the Ashley of Ashley Sack was probably from.
All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming this evening. Hope you have a great summer and look forward to seeing you back here on October 17th. Thank you.